that context, then I'm really quite happy to have Dr. Harold put off with us tonight. Al is an old friend that we've spent far too many times sitting in board meetings for forever and ever in Las Vegas and other places on, on boards that we sat on. But I've come to appreciate him particularly because he's a world-class physicist. I mean, he's built an extraordinary international reputation in a number of fields. And the thing that's common to all of his kind of engagement, all of these, is that um, Hal has, is permeable. Hal is one of those guys who is open to ideas, open to the possibilities that uh, most people or lots of people are not. And that's what makes him a really quite interesting guy. Uh, you're going to hear all about this program that he did for the CIA, but he's also in the forefront of doing physics on alternative energy, zero-point energy. He's probably the world's expert in the area of zero-point energy. He's also interested in faster-than-light travel and anti-gravity kind of things and how you build a ship to take you to Alpha Centauri, and, uh, and it's really quite fascinating every time I get a chance to uh, spend some time and talk with him. And people are after him like crazy, and I'm just blessed that he answers my telephone calls on our <laughs> So we're really quite happy to have you with us tonight, Hal. Uh, we're also happy to have uh, Joe McMonagle. Uh, Joe is, is sitting down here, and Joe McMonagle, you'll hear about Joe McMonagle. Joe McMonagle, McMonagle was the first remote viewer. He was a warrant officer in the Army at the time and is responsible for a number of the things that Hal's going to talk about. And maybe if we're lucky we'll get him to come up afterwards and tell us a quick story or something about some of the things he literally did. This will make for an interesting question and answer period afterwards. But to start it off, Dr. Harold put off. Thank you. Thanks, Well, to begin with, a reasonable question might be, what's a nice physicist like you doing in an area like this? <laughs> but I think you'll see, I'm going to give you the answer to, those, to that question, <clears throat> and I think you'll see that without a doubt, this has been one of the most fascinating pieces of my career. Not one that I planned, as you'll see, but one that uh, just turned up, and there I was. The right guy in the right place at the right time, or right guy in the wrong place at the right time. <laughs> You'll see that I've started, I've labeled this CIA initiated remote viewing program at SRI International. Although CIA initiated it and the first programs were with the CIA, it wasn't very long before as our results began, uh, began to be known around the community that we then en ended up with separate contracts with the Navy, with the Air Force, with the Army, with some places I still can't name. And finally, the Defense Intelligence Agency came in as kind of an oversight, uh, over umbrella kind of function. And so most of the work that we did uh, in this period was uh, really, you would have to say, a DIA program, Defense Intelligence Agency. To give you a bit of a timeline, <clears throat> historically the project was top secret, special access program. And you'll see these names, Scan8, Sunstreak, Centerlane, Grillflame, and so on. What that meant was that they were also code word protected. So that means that someone could have a top secret clearance, but they could not get access to the program or to any of its results unless they were on a special list. It was that very well protected. At present, about 20% of the content of the program is still classified. But a declassification program uh, began as the Cold War was winding down in 1995. In July of 95, the CIA program, which ran for three years, was declassified, including most of the content. And in September of 95, an unclassified history of the program was released, but not very much of the content published as part of a CIA-funded uh, study to give an overview of the program. Oops, I must have pushed the wrong button. Okay, 
Yeah, let's see if we I'll do it this way. As part of this declassification program, uh, many of the documents began to be declassified, and that's the tally as of the present time. 90,000 pages have been released. And another 20,000 pages are still classified. Now, they are actually classified for good reasons. Uh, many of the uh, remote viewing uh, involved uh, remote viewing terrorist activities, involved remote viewing uh, drug running. And so actually a lot of the parts that are still classified are actually to protect the viewers. Because if the bad guys out there began to realize how good remote viewing was, it could create a problem for remote viewers. So that's a large part of why some of the material remains classified. Now maybe one of the most uh, paranormal things you might say of the program was the fact that it ever got started at a place like SRI. This is SRI in uh, Menlo Park, California. This set of buildings here. At the time it was doing about $300 million worth of business a year. Uh, about a third of it for private industry, two thirds of it for the government and of the part done for the government, about half of it for uh, Department of Defense and intelligence agencies. When the program started, we were in a building up front here called uh, uh, Bioelectronics, but very quickly when the program, because of its results, began to get highly classified, we ended up in a building called the Radio Physics Laboratory here, which was guarded, and our program was in a secluded cubicle on top of the building, cyber lock doors and all that kind of thing. Now the way I got involved in this was that <clears throat> I had just finished uh, co-authoring a textbook while I was at Stanford University on fundamentals of quantum electronics, lasers, that kind of thing. And there's nothing like writing a textbook to realize how little you know. And as part of that uh, quandary of struggling to put things in the textbook and then realizing what you don't know, I became interested in the issue that many physicists at the time were interested in, and that is, well, we can handle inanimate uh, objects, we can handle particle collisions, we can look at astrophysical phenomena, but what about things like life, like consciousness? Is it just that it's too complex? but eventually we'll be able to figure it all out from quantum physics, or do we have to extend physics? And so that was something I was struggling with, as were many of my colleagues, and about that time was when uh, a well-known uh, polygraph expert by the name of Cleve Baxter was doing experiments, and one day, just on a lark, he happened to connect his polygraph up to a plant. They see on people, and then he thought of, uh, burning a leaf on the plant to see what response he would get. When he had the thought, the plant responded. And so that started a whole series of experiments where he seemed to have gathered uh, data indicating that uh, living organisms that are brought up together are somehow in, in contact with each other. And so I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, these days we would talk about in terms of quantum entanglement. I thought, okay, well maybe we can learn something about organic life, consciousness, or whatever, by examining interactions between plants, between algae cultures, or whatever. So what I did, from a purely physics standpoint, I wrote up a proposal to be funded where I was going to take some algae culture that had grown together, separate them by five miles, uh, zap one with a laser beam, and see if there was a response on the other one. See if I could measure the velocity of propagation between the two, and so on. So I sent that off to Cleve Baxter to see what he thought of my idea. And one of these serendipitous things, I gotta tell you, it scares me when I think how my life has changed because of real flukes. But here's an example. It just so happened that Cleve Baxter went to a cocktail party in New York City. And while there, he met an artist by the name of Ingo Swan. Now Swan had also been doing some, quote, psychokinesis experiments at City College in New York. And so when he heard about Cleve's experiments, he said, well, can I come over to your, to your uh, lab and see if, uh, if I could affect your plants? 
And so Cleve invited him over. While he was there, he happened to see my proposal on the desk. And so uh, he wrote me a letter. This is the kind of art, you can't see it too well here. Uh, he, he's actually a well-known artist. Many of his uh, paintings have uh, been on book covers and magazine covers. Um, in his letter, he said, look, why do you want to work with algae cultures? They can't tell you what's happening. You should be working with someone like me. <laughs> At least I could tell you what's happening. Now, ordinarily, this is the kind of letter I would have just thrown in the garbage can, except he included with it uh, a write-up on the work he had done with uh, Gertrude Schmeidler in City College in New York, where, in fact, he had apparently been able to raise and lower the temperature of sensitive temp temperature measuring devices that were in thermos bottles. Well, as a physicist, that caught my attention. So I invited him to come out to SRI, and that's him on the right. And uh, in preparation for his visit, I started talking to my, my friends and colleagues, and they said, you know, these guys are all frauds and charlatans. You better really have something that if he shows the result, you know it could not have been by some kind of trickery. Well, fortunately at the time, I had access to a well-shielded magnetometer, which is just a super high-tech version of a compass needle. It was buried inside of electrical shielding, magnetic shielding, superconducting shielding. It was thermally isolated, uh, acoustically isolated, and buried in the floor of the building. This was built uh, on a Navy contract to detect uh, quarks, sub-nuclear sub particles. And the idea was, if you saw any kind of signal coming out of this thing, you knew you had detected uh, what you were looking for because this was supposed to be imperturbable from the outside. So when he showed him up, I took him over there and I said, uh, well, I'd like for you to uh, see if you can perturb this. And he says, well, where is it? And I said, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's under the floor. And he says, well, I need to look at it. I said, no, no, it's, it's you know, superconducting. It's, uh, it's got liquid helium uh, in there. I mean, we can't let you look at it. And he said, no, I don't mean that way. Just, I, I will just look at it, meaning what we now call remote viewing. Ordinarily, uh, the output from the device has this sort of sinuous wave. It takes about, uh, I don't know, a minute to go through a cycle. And when he, quote, looked at it, it did that. And he was drawing what he saw inside. Well, of course, a poor graduate student whose life depended on this panicked. <laughs> and he said, oh, something must be wrong. Maybe there are bubbles in the line. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can find out what's wrong. And by the way, after the fact, we found out that the drawing he made little sketch and description of what he uh, put down there it was in fact quite accurate and this had never been published before. So after a few minutes went by and the graduate student couldn't, whoops, couldn't uh, find any problem, he said, well, why don't you do what you did again? And there it was. And I asked him, of course, well, his name is Ingo Swan. I said, Ingo, how did you do that? He said, I didn't do anything. I just looked at it, and that happened. So the graduate student uh, asked us to leave. <laughs> Go have lunch somewhere. Come back later, and we'll see if he can do it again. And meanwhile, he'll give me a chance to get a good baseline and see if there's something wrong with my system. And so while we were gone for lunch, uh, this went through several cycles. We brought him back in. And we said, okay, Ingo, well, look at it again. And that happened. So he said, well, uh, I, I don't want you around here anymore. <laughs> we left. He went ahead and gathered data for hours. And the system worked just fine. There's a whole other story I could tell you about the Navy showing up and say, we gave you all this money to make something imperturbable. What, what happened here? Uh, that's another story. <laughs> So I wrote this up as a physicist would, and I circulated around my colleagues and said, you know, can you come up with any reason why, you know, this might be?